I was dealing with <coughs> small c in, in parentheses, <coughs> uh, the interrelationship or relationship between the persons in the Old Testament. And we saw, for instance, in uh, Zechariah 2, 6 to 11, maybe that one, yeah. where, where Jehovah is speaking and Jehovah says, Jehovah sent me. And so I think that should be a, a problem toward Jehovah's Witness. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Because Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New. Mm -hmm. If you're a witness for Jesus, then you're Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> but uh, how can Jehovah send Jehovah? Well, the answer is there's a Jehovah Father sending Jehovah the Son. They have to come to the New Testament to see the, that in its full, fullness, but you have these things in the Old Testament that uh, would cause someone who's studying it to uh, question why. All right. Uh, notice uh, <coughs> we also see the three persons, say, in redemption. Uh, look at Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, yeah. and he's uh, referring back to their redemption out of Egypt. It's interesting how his later writers uh, even <coughs> go back and tell us it was the Holy Spirit operating back then, when we have no reference to it in the, for instance, the books of Exodus and Numbers and, and so on. But notice chapter 63. Well, first of all, 61.1. We already kind of looked at that one. This is the one Jesus quoted when he preached in his hometown synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the God good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable, <coughs> acceptable year of the Lord and the day of, of vengeance of our God, and so on. And Jesus, of course, stopped right there after in the middle of that second verse and put a period where that comma is because the day of vengeance is still going to be the second coming. Well, up to that was the fulfilled in the first coming. But notice the Spirit of the Lord <coughs> is upon me. And of course, who is the me? Christ. Yeah, it's the, it's the Messiah. And uh, it's the Spirit of the Lord God, which would be the Father. So there you have the Trinity in, op in uh, operation in the future uh, messianic uh, age. But then chapter 63, uh, notice in verses uh, 8 to 10, <coughs> where he said, Surely thou art my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he buried them. Now notice you have he here, which would be Yahweh or Jehovah, the one who redeemed them, God. But then he says the angel of his presence saved them. Who would that be? Cross. Yeah, the son. And notice uh, he redeemed them, he buried them, he carried them all the days of old, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. There he was, therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. But here we have reference to the Holy Spirit. And we see how it, uh, they were constantly tempting the Lord, rejecting, rebelling against Moses uh, in the wilderness. But here it says he vexed his Holy Spirit. Now Paul quotes this in Ephesians 4 verse 30. He says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And he's quoting it here. Uh, he uses the word grieve or to wound. And, uh, but here we see a reference then to, the, to Je Jehovah the Father. You have the, the angel of his presence and you have the Spirit, Holy Spirit, all together operating in the, in the redemption of Israel out of Egypt. And of course, the, this of course is, shows the, uh, what we call the economic trinity, that each one has an office in, in his work. And these three have their place to play. We see that in the old in this Old Testament passage. Uh, look at Hosea one seven.
I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord their God. <laughs> I will have mercy upon the house of Judah. Who would that be? It would be the Lord, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But how's the Lord going to save them? <laughs> by the Lord their God. <laughs> In other words, he's going to save them by a different person who is called the Lord their God. Again, you see the distinctions in the persons of the Godhead. All right. Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's look at... Uh, What was the last number? Was it four in parentheses? Or five? Um, or three or four? It was four. four. Okay, this would be five in parentheses. Well, let's make it uh, D, because we're doing still the distinction of persons. Distinction of persons. All right, you have. The fatherhood of God, of course, is fully revealed in the New Testament. No one ever prayed the prayer that Jesus told us to pray in the, in the Lord's in the Sermon on the Mount, "Our Father which art in heaven." Now, Israel recognized uh, God as the Father of Israel, but as a personal relationship of father. They did not have the spirit of adoption. It only came uh, when when the Son came. Therefore, we had the spirit of His Son. So it's through the Son that we have the relationship with the Father. So. No Old Testament saint could uh, call God his father in the same way we can today. But the fatherhood of God is taught in the Old Testament. He is a father to Israel, and he has the characteristics of a father. Uh, in fact, we're still in, close to Isaiah 63. Now look at verse 15. <clears throat> look down from heaven, and behold, from the habitation of thy holiness and thy throne, where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Verse 60, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham was ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledged us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. And so in verse 16 particularly we have uh, the prophet here recognizing uh, the Lord as the father of Israel. The father of Israel. Remember, it says in Hosea 11, 1, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So Israel was called a son. Moses was told uh, to go to, to, eat, to Pharaoh and tell him that, uh, to let his son go. And so the, and, uh, Paul speaks in, in Romans 9 of the adoption. Israel had the adoption as being an adopted son. And so there's that relationship of a father to an adopted son in the Old Testament. But uh, look at some other passages <coughs> in uh, Deuteronomy 32, 6. Do ye thus requite uh, the Lord, God, O foolish people, in that wise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? And so he's speaking of a father who has redeemed them, who bought them, but also it literally created them established them. So again, he's spoken of as a father to the nation. And then in uh, Malachi 2.10 Had he not all one father? <laughs> Have he no one Hath not one God created us? Have we not all one Father? Hath one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother and profane the covenant of our fathers? And so again, uh, the Lord is recognized as the Father of Israel who created the, who created the nation. Uh, Exodus 4.22, there speaks of Israel as being his son.
and then Psalm 2 7. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So there we have a reference to the son as well. And the God who begot him, there would be the father. Paul in, first, in Acts chapter 13 in the synagogue of Antioch in Pisidia quoted this and applied it to the resurrection. That God begot him as the, uh, the son of David. This whole psalm is a, is a coronation psalm with the coronation of David and the Davidic kings. And here, in, in, and again in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, that he was declared to be the son of God by, with power by the resurrection of the dead. Now, he wasn't made the son of God, he was declared to be. In other words, as he was raised as the God-man, he was the son of God before, but now he's a God-man. As the God-man, he's raised and declared to be the son of God and the uh, begotten of the Father. But here, the, the relationship between God as a Father and the Messiah, and he's talking about the Messiah, in verse 2, against the Lord and against his anointed, that's the word Mashiach, Messiah, Messiah which the Greek word gives us Christ, while the Hebrew word gives us Messiah. They both mean anointed. And so we see the uh, talking here about David as the anointed king, then all his descendants are called anointed ones. And of course, the anointed one that's coming is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, this is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament. All right, uh, <coughs> the son, the uh, F. The Son. Look at chapter 30 of Proverbs, verse 4. ascended up into heaven, or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? Interesting questions, aren't they? And of course, who would be the one who, who bound all the waters, the uh, winds in his fist, and uh, bound the waters in the, like in the garment and established the ends of the earth? Well, that'd be God, wouldn't it? The creator. But then he says, what's his son's name? So it's evident that the father, the, the, the creator has a son here in the Old Testament. And uh, so it shouldn't surprise us then that we see him, uh, see the son being revealed in the New Testament. Right, uh, again, put down Psalm 2, 1 to 12. Throughout my son, this to have it begotten thee. Along with that, put Acts 13, 39. And, Ro and Revelation, uh, Romans rather, 1, 4. 1, 4. Now this <coughs> also brings up the, uh, the many passages that point to that the Messiah would be God, the deity of the Messiah. The deity of the Messiah. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. When we read at Christmas time. Notice the, the wording of it. <clears throat> For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Notice the parallels in here. It didn't say the son was born, the child was born. 
And how would that apply to, to, the, to the Messiah? It speaks of the God man. Yeah. In other words, uh, what, who was born in Bethlehem? Was the Son of God born in Bethlehem or was, the, was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Jesus was. Yeah. His humanity began, but he didn't begin. He's a divine person who's kind of self, a, a human nature. So this child was born and a son was given. And the government shall be, uh, be upon his shoulder. And this, of course, he goes down in verse 7 to speak of the Davidic kingdom. Of the increase of his government and peace, there should be no end of, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice and from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this son who was given, who's going to have the government on his uh, shoulders, is the son of David, who's going to sit on the throne of David. Again, this is the Messiah. Now, notice his names here. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, since they seem to be pairs, it probably this one. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, when uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah and his wife, telling them about the birth of Samson, and uh, Manoah asked him what his name was. And he said, it's wonderful. <laughs> That's where it is. What do you ask me for that name? Because it's wonderful. Now the word mighty God is El Gibor. El is the word for God. Gibor means mighty one, warrior. <clears throat> now the Jehovah's Witnesses know, well, that's just, it's not almighty God, it's mighty God. So it couldn't be the almighty. But the same word is found in other places referring to Jehovah. Jehovah is called El Gabor. So here we have the Messiah called by a divine name. So what would that make him? If he's the mighty God, he has to be deity, would not he? So here we have a clear-cut prophecy that the Messiah, the son of David, is going to be the mighty God. Uh, the Father, the everlasting Father is the idea of the Father of the origin of, of uh, that which is eternal and the Prince of Peace. And then, of course, along with this, you find references to the child being born. And the first reference is, is, is chapter 7, verse uh, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give thee a sign <coughs> here to Ahaz. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. You'll find it. the land is called Emmanuel's land. And uh, in chapter 8, verse, verse 8, shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. And then in verse 10, you have a form of the word in chapter 8. Take counsel together, and, in, and it shall be not, uh, come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. Emmanuel, there, there. This uh, it's not the name, but a, but a, but a verb form. And so, uh, Emmanuel means God is with us. All right, Micah chapter five and verse two. Here's another Christmas verse. Micah and Isaiah were contemporaries. In fact, Micah is called a little Isaiah because of the message. And both of them speak of the son that's going to be the child that's going to be born. But thou of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So here's one who's going to be born in Bethlehem to be the ruler, but he's also been coming since he, from everlasting. <laughs> now how can he be from everlasting and still be born in Bethlehem? <laughs> well, he's a deity. Yeah, that's God. In fact, that word everlasting is applied to God. Some more modern, even conservatives have stated that that's referring just to his, an his ancestry, a long, a long uh, ancestry. But uh, the word itself is used of God, the everlasting. And again, and he put it with chapter 9, verse 6 of Isaiah, and chapter 7, verse 14. That's certainly 
uh, not uh, a stretch to say this is referring to his deity and his humanity. Humanity in his birth, deity in, uh, in his pre-existent nature. God manifest in the flesh. But then, of course, the Spirit is spoken of as the Spirit of the Lord. <coughs> the word is ruach, ruach, in the Hebrew. And it's found 62 times in the Old Testament. Of course, Genesis 1, you see that God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of the Lord, like a bird over a nest, uh, fluttered over the face of the deep. And then God said, and God said, and God said. There you see the word. Now let's look back at uh, Isaiah 63 again. And notice something here about the Spirit. Many make the Spirit merely mean the power of God. Of course, this is what Unitarians and Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, will say. But again, remember, when you talk about the power of the Spirit, then you're saying the power of the power, which makes, doesn't make any sense. And we've learned some things about the spirit that uh, a thing called power can't do by itself. All right, 63, <coughs> 10, 11. Is that what I gave you? 63, 9, and 10. All right, let's see. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. All right, how can a thing, a power, be vexed? Or put it in the New Testament, be grieved. Only a person can be grieved, right? right. A person has a feeling of, of being wounded or, or harmed. And he turned to be their enemy. <laughs> so who's the he referring back to? Yeah. Holy Spirit. And he fought against them. So we're not talking about just the power, we're talking about a, holy, uh, a person. Then in verse 11, then he remembered the days of old, <coughs> Moses and his people, uh, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the uh, shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Again, we see the Holy Spirit is uh, being with them in the, uh, in the Exodus. All right, uh, look at Isaiah 40, verse 13. Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Now, if the Holy Spirit is just the power of God, how could you possibly direct or teach? So he has to be a person to be directed or taught. And of course, nobody can teach him, nobody can direct him. But the point is, he's a person that, that you can make such a statement about. He's a divine person. He's a person of the Almighty. Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, great prayer. Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, and Daniel 9. All in the same period, basic time period. All are revival prayers. All right, 930, 920. Referring to the, the historical background then that uh, how God has... has uh, uh, led them to, to the centuries, redeemed them, and so on. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. Now again, can a thing instruct? No. So here again, the Holy Spirit is a person. And then in verse 30, 
Hey, many years didst thou forbear them and testify against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet could not, they would not strive or give ear, therefore givest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. All right, so here God testified or, or witnessed to them by his spirit in the prophets. So the prophets then were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke by inspiration. And again, we see the Holy Spirit as a person here. Genesis 6 3. Thou will not, thy spirit will not always strive with man. Look at Psalm 139 7. I'm going the wrong direction of the Bible all the time here. Like the sign I saw in North Dakota. You're making good, you're going the wrong way, but you're making good time. <laughs> I'm not even making good time. All right, Psalm 139 and verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? All right, so notice here that the Holy Spirit here is omnipresent, which would make him what? God. God. Make him God. And then 51.11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David recognized the Holy Spirit presence as essential to his uh, being able to rule as king. Right, so there's a, then Zechariah 12.10. It's a future prophecy of the future conversion of Israel. And he's going to pour out his spirit upon them in, the, in that day. See what happens when God pours out his spirit. And I will pour out upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. <clears throat> Again, notice grace and supplication. Grace is a, is a divine, a divine uh, gift. And so it would point to the deity of the Holy Spirit. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourning for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his only his firstborn. And so that when the Spirit of God is poured out, they're going to see that they've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, that they've rejected is going to be revealed to them. And they're going to be brought a spirit of bitterness and repentance. So repentance and faith will be born in Israel when the Spirit of God's poured out. So you can see a number of these, uh, not only the distinction of persons, uh, references to their deity, but also even to their, their, their office work in the, in the Divine Trinity seen in the Old Testament. By way of putting under the deity of the, of the Messiah, put also Psalm 45, 6, and 7, where God calls him God. I think we used that already before, it was, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And they say he's anointed you with the oil of gladness. F in parentheses with the Holy Spirit. All right, then we'll go to uh, five, some other significant passages. Let me see. In other words, there are allusions to the triune Godhead, even though they are not clear-cut uh, you know, verses that you could actually prove it from. Okay, Genesis 48, 13, 16. Okay, 
Okay, 4813. <clears throat> and Joseph took them both, <laughs> Ephraim on his right hand and toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And so <clears throat> here's Israel's blind, and he puts the firstborn at his right hand and his the next one, the second one at his left hand, and then he crosses his hands. Because it wasn't the firstborn was not going to be the firstborn. The other one got the birthright. Ephraim got the birthright. <clears throat> and then in verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Bless the lads, and let thy name be upon them, in the name of my, fa my father Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. <clears throat> Notice he speaks of, he's blessing him in the name uh, of God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the angel which redeemed me from all evil. There's that one he wrestled with that night. So again, you see a distinction of persons there. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. Here's the uh, Levitical blessing, the priestly blessing. What chapter is that, Doc? Uh, number 6. Verse 22, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them. So here's the priestly blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Notice the three references here uh, to Jehovah, like Yahweh. Verse 24, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. There's the blessing of the Father. Verse 25, the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Of course, who is the, who is the person of the Godhead who reveals God? And, and the, son. the Son. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. There's the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Of course, we see in the New Testament the name is the Father and Son Holy Spirit. His ultimate revelation of his name. You want to be a blessing to somebody? Put God's name on them. In other words, the name refers to a revelation of his character, who he is. <clears throat> Just teaching this in Sunday school Sunday. I'm in Revelation 22. And... Uh, In verse 4, it says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. So the other priestly blessing will be there. He's caused his face to shine upon them and put his name on our foreheads. In other words, we're in, in our personalities, we're going to be able to reflect the glories and the, and the attributes of God. All oh, attributes of God. The beauty excellencies of God. Also said in chapter 2, he gives us a name that nobody else knows. So there's going to be something about God that each one of us is going to know that nobody else is going to know. Our own little personal good time with him and revelation of him. All right, uh, <clears throat> let's see what else we got here. 2 Samuel 23, verses 2 and 3. 
23, 2 and 3. We looked at this when we studied the Bible. Start with verse 1. Now this, these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse and the man whom, who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of, Jeho of Israel said, <coughs> The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my mouth, or in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel speaketh to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling by the fear of the Lord, her God. If the word rock could be a referral to uh, the Messiah, then you have a trinity there. And he being a type of the, of the, of the Messiah, again you have a similarity to Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, as upon me. But you do see a distinction of persons there. Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Who is the breath of God? Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. 34, 3 and 5. 3 to 5. Okay. We'll magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me out of all my, uh, my troubles, all my fears. They looked unto him, and were ashamed, and their faces were not ashamed. Enlightened, and their faces were not ashamed. That one there is not as clear. All right, uh, Daniel 2.47 and 9.19. After re re uh, revealing the, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had that he had forgotten and then explaining it, Interpreting it, uh, we have this word that concludes it. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of oh, truth it is, it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. <laughs> I don't think Nebuchadnezzar understood the Trinity, but notice here, <laughs> there certainly seems to be an illusion here. He's a God of gods, a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, 19. Here, O Lord, or O Lord, here. O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, hearken, and do. Defer not for mine own sake, O oh my God. So he's, he's, here's a threefold appeal to the Lord here. Adonai. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, hearken. Now, you may say it's a stretch to see the Trinity there, but uh, why just three? Why didn't he say, Lord, 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 Lord? Or it's Lord, Lord, or Lord. He said, Lord, Lord, Lord. And again, why is it just the Abraham, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph? Well, because these three, uh, particularly, Abraham had two sons, so God had to choose between the one and the other. It's not Ishmael, it's, it's Isaac. Uh, Isaac had two sons, and there had to be a choice between Ish, uh, Esau and Jacob. But Jacob had 12 sons, and he didn't choose between any of them. All of them were in, in, were in the covenant. So in other words, 
covenant was confirmed to Abraham and then ratified to Isaac and then ratified to Jacob. So when that was completed, then the covenant was made with the nation. And so he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, but uh, interesting that, that the God of Abraham is the father who's the source of all things. And uh, remember, nothing that began, originated with Abraham counted. <laughs> remember? Hagar said, you know, God's, God says, God helps those, the scripture says God helps those who help themselves. So he, she went and tried to help him here and produced Ishmael. And Ishmael grew up until he was about 13 years of age and Abraham had all his hopes in him. And God says, I'm going to now send you your son. He said, what about, what if Ishmael might live before? He said, well, I didn't have anything to do with Ishmael. Anything that began with Abraham might soar pretty high. And anything that begins with us, what's going to happen after a while? <laughs> it's going to come down. But if it begins with God, what's going to happen? It's going to accomplish something. So, it's, so we see that, he, that Abraham is, is the father. The God of Abraham is the father, the source of all things. The God of, of Isaac is the son in whom are all things. Notice uh, Isaac was born in the land. He never left the land. Everything was given to him. <laughs> Nothing was original with him. Even his sin was his father he borrowed from. And so in other words, in Christ, he's our all in all, isn't it? We don't have anything outside of outside of him. Jacob represents the discipline of the Spirit. Before Jacob could get into the blessing, God had a beat on him for, for 20 years and so, and, and to finally make a cripple out of him so he could lean on his staff and worship. Lean on his, so God has to make a cripple out of us to make us worshipers. And then, but the last years of, Abraham, of Jacob are far outshined uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Abraham, when testing time came, a famine, he went down to Egypt. And God had to send him back with his tail between his legs, in a sense. Uh, you find that uh, another famine came in Isaac's day. And Isaac went down to the border, and God says, don't come across that line. That's so he, what he was going to. Now, Jacob had a famine in his day, and uh, <clears throat> he had heard that his own son, that he thought was dead, is alive in Egypt. But he didn't go into Egypt on his own. He went, to the, he went to the border and offered a sacrifice to God. And God told him, don't be afraid to go. And that was Jacob. But he starved to death in the land other than go. So he'd learned something after a while, you see. And uh, when he got before Pharaoh, uh, it said he blessed Pharaoh. The greater blesses the lesser. And so here was the great king, the greatest king in the, in the whole world. But Jacob felt that he, <laughs> this little shepherd, was had a greater position than, than Pharaoh. So uh, when Abraham was uh, didn't get straight, but that it was that the God chose the second, not the first. And Isaac didn't. He was going to give the blessing to Esau. Remember, but God had overruled that, even through David, Jacob's and Sarah and, uh, and Rachel's trickery. And finally, when uh, Abraham found out that, uh, that he'd been tricked and said that he'd blessed Isaac, he said, and he shall be blessed. Now, his faith there was that he submitted to God's overruling. So neither one of them got, the, got that in their head that the elder shall serve the younger. But here we see, we just saw that what happened when uh, here's old blind Jacob, and he brings Ephraim and Manasseh, puts the, puts the first one on his right hand and the other on his left. What did he do? He crossed his hands and blessed Ephraim rather than Jacob and Manasseh. So uh, God's uh, Holy Spirit discipline is very effective. And if you want a good book on that, where I got it all from is uh, Watchman Neasel's book on uh, Changed into His Image, I think is what it is, or Likeness. The, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a very rich book. So you can still see the, see the Trinity there in the... Uh, in the Old Testament. Of course, you have to see it in the New Testament to, read, to do that. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Isaiah 6 is a uh, great chapter on the Trinity. Again, uh, we have a hint at it in when, when it says, who will go for us, remember? 
But it's in the New Testament that we see that the Trinity is really revealed there. Let's look at Isaiah 6 and read that first part anyway, and then uh, go to the New Testament. This is the call of Isaiah. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Adonai, <coughs> sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain they covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one said unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth. The whole earth is full of his glory. All right, so here again we see a threefold holy here, which would, would uh, uh, could also be thought of as Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. And then he sees, of course, uh, the, the posts of the doors are moved in verse 4. Verse 5, once he saw the holiness of God, he said, Woe is me, in verse 5. I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from off the tongs from, uh, with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, by the way, having hot coal put on your tongue doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? Well, getting right with God sometimes is painful, isn't it? He said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Notice it was from the altar, the place of atonement, that... Uh, the purging came. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people heavy fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. And he said, how long? He said, until the cities be wasted without habitation and so on. And so he's got a message of really of judgment. The message is going to harden them and blind them because of their own reaction to it. In other words, it's, uh, when you reject light, what's it do? It, it hardens your heart, blinds you. All right, now look in the New Testament to uh, John chapter 12. John has been pointing out what he said in the first uh, chapter, he came to his own, his own received him not. And so from chapters 1 through 12, his own came to his own, his own received him not. And we see the culminate of it, culmination of it here. And starting with uh, verse 38, then, oh, let's go back, uh, verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he said, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? There's Isaiah 53, verse 1. Therefore, he could, therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now, where is he getting that from? Isaiah, Isaiah 6, right? Mm -hmm. Isaiah 6, 10. Verse 41, these things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Whose glory did Isaiah see then in chapter 6? Jesus. Yeah, the glory of Christ, the Messiah. All right, then turn to uh, Acts chapter 28. Here's Paul now at the last of the book of Acts. He's done... The Jew has rejected the message in the homeland and, and at the, at, in Jerusalem and at the homeland. Everywhere he went, he preached the Jew first and they turned from the gospel. Now he's in Rome, the capital of the whole empire. He brought the Jews of the city there and he's witness to them and they rejected it. So notice this final word in James here, in, in uh, of Luke here in chapter 28. Verse 25. And when, he had, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto your fathers. 
saying, Go ye to this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and should hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentile. Now, where again did he get that uh, 27th verse? 26 and 27. Isaiah 6. And who said that? Uh, Verse 25. Holy Spirit? Yeah, the Holy Ghost said it. So what do you have in Isaiah 6? A father, of course, but he saw the glory of Christ, and, he, and the Holy Spirit spoke. And so who will go for us? Who are the us? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in Isaiah chapter 6. All right, number three, New Testament proof. Now the fuller revelation of the triunity, triunity of God is seen in the New Testament. Notice that the Trinity is revealed in the Bible in a context of progressive revelation. You see, progressively we see these things. You see the seeds in Genesis, then the tree of grows into its fullness. All right, one in parentheses, the Great Commission. We already covered that. There's where you see the ultimate revelation of God's name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Two in parentheses, the apostolic benediction. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Let's look at that. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Notice the order here. Lord Jesus Christ, God, Holy Spirit. <laughs> so the persons of the God here are not, not jealous of who gets first building, do they? And notice these divine graces. Grace, love, communion come from three persons. And yet God is one. All right, three in parentheses, the teaching of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 14. Of course, this is where you, where you see it in the uh, upper room discourse before his, uh, the night of his betrayal and arrest. 1416. <clears throat> and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And who is this comforter? Verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but he, ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That's right, so I, the Son, will pray the Father. He'll send the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 23. If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and take our abode with him. So there's the Son and the Father living in us, and we already saw that the Comforter is going to come live in us. So we see that Christian experience is a... Trinitarian experience. Verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So again, Father, I, the Son, and the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Chapter 16.
from verse 1526, And when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So he saw where the Father sent him. Now he said, I'm going to pray the Father, he'll send him. But he also said, I'm going to send him. All right, 16. Uh, verse 7, nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Verse 10, of sin, uh, righteousness, because I go to my Father. Verse 13, how when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall speak, that uh, he shall hear, that shall he speak. And of course, he shall glorify me. Then verse 15, he shall take the th all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So the things that the Father has given the Son, the Son's going to give to the Spirit to give to us. Give us the references here to the, the three divine persons. Chapter 20, 21, and 22. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So again, you see the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Here. All right, four and four, these, the Synoptic Gospels and Acts. Synoptic Gospels. And the Acts. We already put. We already looked at chapter th Matthew three sixteen and seventeen. Jesus is in the water. The Father spake from heaven, and the Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Uh, that's parallel to Mark one ten eleven. Luke three twenty two. All right, look at Matthew twelve eighteen. He's quoting here from Isaiah <coughs> chapter 41, 42, 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment unto the Gentiles. And so here would be another Old Testament verse we could have used. And Jesus applies it to himself here in this passage. He's the, he's the servant, Messiah, the, the, the servant of Jehovah. Father has chosen him, Jehovah has chosen him, he's his beloved, and now he's uh, put his spirit upon him. Look at verse 32 in the same chapter. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, neither in the world to come. There's the at least the two persons. Look at Mark 329. 
verse 28, I've already said to you, but all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemy is wherewith so many, so they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And of course, again, this would refer to this, the Father as well. All right, Matthew 28, 19, we already gave that Father, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, particularly you have uh, Luke and Acts that go together. And uh, there's a number of verses. In fact, Luke has been called the theologian of the Holy Spirit. And it's Luke that especially shows how uh, the Spirit of God operated in the life of the Lord Jesus. And of course, you can't escape the fact the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the book of Acts. So we'll have to wait for those verses when we study pneumatology. But certainly the uh, distinction and the different works of the persons of the Godhead are Revealed in Luke. But especially uh, with uh, the Holy Spirit on Christ. Acts, Luke 135, here's the word to Mary how she's going to be able to have a son. And here's what uh, Gabriel says to her. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in thee, of thee shall be called the Son of God. All right. Who's the, who's the highest? Father. Yeah, Father. And uh, his power is the Holy Spirit. It's going to give the miraculous birth to Jesus, which is the Son of God. So you got the Trinity there. Chapter 3, verse 22. And we saw this is uh, the Spirit of God coming upon him as baptized baptism. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and the voice came from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's very certain. Certainly that's the, that's the Father. Luke only tells us what, he, uh, what we see in verse 21. He was praying when he was baptized, when the Holy Spirit came. Being baptized and praying. So Luke gives us a lot of information on the prayer life of Jesus. Check the different times he prayed. One thing that co convicts me is that when he got more and more crowds and more and more people, more and more to do, he withdrew to prayer. Mm -hmm. When I get too much to do, I don't have time to pray. <laughs> when I've got too much to do, that's when I should be praying. Luther one time said, I've got so much work to do, to do I can't get it done in less than four hours of prayer. Look at chapter 4, 1, and 14. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So he was full of the, he was born of the Spirit, the Spirit anointed him, now he's full of the Spirit, and the Spirit leads him, and he leads, of course, into temptation, but he triumphs, and so in verse 14, he returns in the power of the Spirit. Verse 14. If you want the power of the Spirit, then you have to be led of the Spirit, tested, as you accept His fullness. He's going to fill you, and then He's going to lead you to test you. And then you meet the test, and then the, then the power is there. You're going to see what you're going to do with that power. You're going to use it the wrong way. Of course, there's many, many references. Uh, he is a, Acts 10, 37 to 41, where uh, he said the Spirit, he anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost, and he went about doing, uh, delivering from the power of Satan and so on. A lot of verses on the Spirit of God in the, in the book of Luke and Acts. Uh, when... Uh, in the first chapter, you have Elizabeth and uh, Zechariah, both filled with the Spirit, and they spoke with prophetic message, the Spirit of prophecy.
think a good example <coughs> is in, in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost has fully come, where's the Holy Spirit came? And notice the balance that we have to have in the, when it comes to the Trinity. One of the, one of the criticisms that is given to the charismatic movement is because they talk so much about the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, who's he going to talk about? Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. At the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came, what did Peter preach? The Holy Spirit? No, he said, this is the Holy Spirit. But he sent him, and he's Lord, and you crucified him, so you need to repent. And uh, the Father sent the Spirit. <coughs> no, the Father raised the Son and exalted him, and he sent the Spirit. So you have the, uh, the Trinity there. And the uh, balance is that, that the Spirit of God came and glorified Christ and, and pointed to him. And uh, 3,000 were saved, not because they had a lesson on the Holy Spirit, but they had the Gospel. Hmm. And you see that throughout the, throughout the book. All right. Uh, we'll quit right there in the chapel.